La cultura armena es una cultura antica, es una cultura muy antigua. What can I say about the role Armenians played in world culture? First, Armenian culture is one of the oldest, back to the fourth century before Christ, and likely to even earlier times. And that culture has a noble title in antique cultures of the world. Therefore, to be this old is in itself worth something. Second, Armenian culture is a continuation of that ancient beginning with its language, letters, and style of expression, continuing to this day. All this with the sufferings, tribulations, and persecutions that the Armenian people have endured throughout the course of their history. We all know that Armenian culture has repeatedly given rebirth to other cultures, and I believe other cultures should feel indebted to Armenian culture. And in spite of their many tribulations, the Armenians have succeeded to live again and to flourish. This is Armenia, or rather, whatever has been left from the ancient country which once used to remind us of a manuscript made from stone. Our history, however, is the history of a country situated behind the seven seas, the name of which used to be Armenia. Perhaps you will wonder now, how is the sea connected to this country made of stone? Do not be doubtful, Armenians and the sea are as harmonious with one another as Armenians are with the stones and manuscripts. Let us recall some names. Ivazovsky, Mahokhian, the painters of the sea. Admiral Isakov, Admiral Serebryakov, Artsat Agurtsyan, There were also these insane Armenians who have embarked on a journey to follow the memories of their past, carrying on their shoulders a replica of the ship built based on their memories. But before reaching the sea, they had to climb up and down mountains, traverse unusual roads full of different obstacles. This is how the interrupted communication between the Armenians and sea began. Kilikia, a country with a glorious past. Our visit has a very special meaning. It symbolizes a return, a return to our roots. People used to call it a little Armenia. Marco Polo has mentioned in his notes, 
There are two countries called Armenia. One is the biggest and the other one is the little. The little which he had referred to Kidikia has a king who governs a country based on a code of law. There are many big and small towns here and all of them thrive in prosperity. Armenians have many reminiscent songs, but this one is very unique. It is the prayer and the dream of a nation that has maintained its spirituality. Ruins of forts on these cliffs are silent witnesses of the 300 century old state of Kilikian Armenia. There was a time when there used to be flags here, symbolizing the kingdom of Kilikia, and also guards that would stay awake day and night to defend the borders. With time, the glory of Kilikia has vanished. But the mysterious footsteps and the spirit of its kings, warriors, ambassadors and merchants still remain in the labyrinths of these ruins. If one uses his imagination, he will see the faces of these people looking at him from the past. Who is that? Hovhannes the writer? Kirakos the flourisher? Sarkis? Toros? Whoever it may be, they have all lived with the same principles in their earthly life. Do not take a lot. Do not give less. Do not lie in order to obtain wealth. Be caring. Respect your teachers and praise your parents. The glory of the kings and the wealth garnered by the merchants are all fleeting, but these values are everlasting. These scenes are replacing now those great names and images of the past. Some Turkish TV series are being filmed in the ruins of the fort. Eight hundred years ago, 
In 1211, after his visit to Kilikia, German cleric Willebrand Oldenburg wrote, There are Franks, Greeks, Turks, Armenians, and other nations living here, but Armenians are the majority. The Armenians here are very religious and good Christians. They have their Pope, whom they call the Catholicos. Toros Roslin was one of those Christian believers. His canvases are currently in different corners around the world, in the most prestigious museums and libraries in Jerusalem, Washington, Baltimore, and in Matanadaran, Manuscript Museum in Yerevan. Let us follow their traces. Jerusalem. Saint Jacob Monastery. Everything here is very mysterious and untouched. Of course, these writings must have been created in a flourishing kingdom. The great manuscripts of Toros Roslin depict the orange and blue that represent the splendid kingdom of Kilikia, while the magnificent reddish fusion illustrates the beauty of the sunset. These used to be memorable times. The Armenian kings of Kilikia, the governors, nobles, and the wealthy merchants would acquire books and manuscripts from writers and painters. Couples with no heir would adapt books instead and later donate them to the church. Famous art expert Ludmila Durnova wrote Toros Roslin was ahead of the Italian painters of the Renaissance for 200 years. Let us listen to our compatriot Lucy Dermanuelian, Tufts University professor, a Roslin expert. And I always come here and I stand in front of the statue of Todos Roslin, this amazing man, and I wonder and wonder about him because we know so very little about him. We only have seven medieval Armenian manuscripts signed by him as painter, two unsigned ones, a fragment. For example, in the Malachian Gospel, in the scene of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead, the head of Christ is about this big, and the figure next to him is about the same size. And it's only when I put a, a slide on a huge screen for lectures that you begin to understand a bit of how Roslin creates the expressions on the individuals that he's portraying. For example, when you look carefully at the image of Christ and his face and the figure next to him, for Christ it's a line under the eyes, the gradation of color in his face. For the figure next to him, the upper part of his face, the eyebrows. And you get a sense of figures here who are haunting and memorable and you begin to understand something of the power of the image. The 
kingdom of Kidikia was based on a powerful culture. The seas, Dallas, Ayas, Adana, Romkla. These cities were not only active trade centers, but were also political, cultural, spiritual, and religious centers. The merchants and nobles who used to come here from all over the world were the primary visitors and clientele of these literary centers. Romkla and Sis used to play a significant role in the development of medieval Armenian artworks and the writings. Romkla. This used to be an important bordering fort. In 1150, Grigor Pahlavuni Catholicos buys it from the Duchess Beatrice de Cartier, and the residence of the Catholicos moves to here from Tsovk. During the rule of Levon Metzagorz, the fort becomes part of the kingdom and one of the most known centers for literature in Kidikia. In 1178, the famous clerical meeting of Romkla took place here. From the end of 12th century, Hromkla developed into a powerful cultural center where the tradition of literature and miniatures continues to expand. In 1292, the Egyptian Mamluks robbed and destroyed Haramkla, burning and damaging all outstanding manuscripts. The residents of the Catholicos moved to the capital, Sis. Renowned German explorer and cleric Wilbern Oldenburg described Sis as follows. Sis does not have a governing power, and it would be just like any other inhabited town, not a city, if the Armenian Archbishop and the Greek Patriarch didn't reside here. However, the fort situated on the top of the mountain protects and looks after the city, which is spread out like an amphitheater. Some say that the town was governed by Dare, who was defeated by the Alexander. In 1378, Sis, like Hromkla, was attacked by the Mamluks. They destroyed and robbed the capital and caused massive devastations everywhere, burning and damaging magnificent manuscripts and unique canvases of that period. The most outstanding and colorful miniatures manuscripts created here are the legacy of Taurus Roslin.
Tufts, but at Harvard, Boston College, Boston University, the University of Massachusetts, and Northeastern University, and in Montreal at McGill University. And in the courses I've taught, it's been very satisfying for me uh, to see that whenever I put up on the screen two slides of Todos Roslin's of manuscripts, the students sit on the edge of their seat and they go, oh, because they're so beautiful. The ornamentation, the coloring, the people who are portrayed, the emotions that are conveyed. I was able to create some of the most remarkable paintings of the Middle Ages. So I've found in all the courses I've taught, in all the slides I've shown of Todos Roslin, he is their favorite painter. There's no one like him. There's humor in the pictures, there is tragedy, and there is always drama of some kind or another. He is truly a remarkable, remarkable painter. And I hope that he will, in time, become better known, much better known, uh, as the field of Armenian art and architecture becomes more and more studied by more and more scholars in the East and West. That is already happening to a certain degree. The Metropolitan Museum's splendid exhibits on Byzantine art, two separated by a number of years, these Two splendid exhibits included examples of medieval Armenian manuscripts and among them uh, works of Todos Roslin. So uh, I think that the examples he shows of scenes from the life of Christ are so often unique and so often portrayed in such a dramatic and meaningful way that anyone studying the subject will come away enhanced and informed and enthralled. Vatican. In order to enter here, we have brought all kinds of permissions. However, this is not just another bureaucratic castle. Whatever you have seen here, through other years has been preserved under very strict rules. And for ages, not everyone was authorized to enter this prohibited area. Although none of Toros Roslin parchments are preserved here, there are other pieces of artwork that represent the great period of the Kidikian miniatures. The pieces here are kept in the secret archives of Vatican. They represent a very important part of our history. These are letters preserved from the 13th century and have been written by the King Levon Metzagorz and were addressed to the Pope Inokventios III. They were in constant communication. Copies of all their letters have been preserved in our archives. However, we have four original letters which are preserved here, in the secret archives of Vatican. These are the only letters in the world with original Armenian Kingdom seals on them. On one side it has the image of King Levon, with text which reads, Levon, the king of Armenia. On the other side, it portrays a lion with a cross. These four seals are invaluable treasures, because these are real golden royal seals. These unique texts are now disclosed to the public for the first time. The region of Cilicia gave a new boost to Armenian-Italian relations because, for the first time since the era of Dikron the Great, an Armenian kingdom existed on the shores of the Mediterranean. Both Genoa and Venice entered the realm of communication of Cilicia. Marinos Anuto was a nobleman who visited Cilicia and returned quite fond of Armenians. Marinos Anuto described the situation of the Armenian kingdom, saying it was surrounded by four monsters. To the west, 
Turks, to the north, Mongols, to the east, Egyptian Mamelukes, and to the south, pirates. A copy is preserved in the library at the Vatican, along with an illuminated manuscript. In the middle is the Armenian king, surrounded by monsters. Another similar warning message was addressed to Carlos the Beautiful by the ambassadors of Cyprus, which read, If the Turks get their hands on Armenia, that means it will be very difficult to overthrow them, if not impossible. These warnings sent to the Kilikian Kingdom by Marino Sanuto, the Greek ambassador, and others about the upcoming threat remind us of warnings the European and American ambassadors had sent to the leaders of their countries on the eve of the Armenian Genocide in 1915. During the years of the Armenian Genocide from 1915 to 1923, a Turk who had robbed one of the famous Armenian monasteries took home with him a parchment. However, at night he saw a very unusual dream and his wandering thoughts began to torture him. A few days after, when there were no longer any more Armenians and Armenian churches in the region, he sells the parchment, the manuscript, to an American missionary and leaves the country that was cursed. Who knows, perhaps this manuscript preserved in this American museum is the one that belongs to Taurus Roslin. are the only culture which has several texts describing the beautiful decorations at the top and giving some kind of interpretation uh, about them. What Taurus Ruslan did when he illustrated the canon tables, the pages which were like an index system to the contents of the New Testament, because the church figures made the connection between the Old and the New Testament. What he did was to show it visually. The Kingdom of Kidikia which had reached the triumph of its glory, started to gradually decline. The constant pirate attacks from one hand and the immoral and selfish lifestyle led by the wealthy and careless rulers on the other entirely destroyed the state. Let us refer again to the notes of Marco Polo. Once the nobles of this kingdom were very strong and powerful, but today they are weak and dishonorable. Today the Armenian people make efforts on their way to democracy. 
But on this journey, they shouldn't lose their honesty, fairness and moral values. Armenian history is the embodiment of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, who died and resurrected for the people. And the commandments of Christ must be a symbol for a nation who has lost millions of people, but preserved its faith. These worries are also noticed in Rostlin's manuscripts. The shine of the gold has made the governors blind. In order to portray the people who had become blind from their love for gold, Rostlin covered his parchments with gold, as well as the pages of the manuscripts. This is where one can observe the real treasure, the wealth. In Roslin's manuscripts, the golden shine represents honesty and consciousness, and not just meaningless and impermanent wealth. Prosperity symbolizes kindness and not greediness or cruelty. It must symbolize intelligence and wisdom, but not stupidity. The wealth accumulated by kings and merchants is not permanent. What is permanent and perpetual is this. Let us remember once again. Do not take a lot. Do not give less. Do not lie in order to obtain wealth. Be caring. Respect your teachers and praise your parents.